Hello everyone, I'm Callie and today I'm going to talk about gender inequality in Japan. And I just want to give a quick preference. Um, I tried my best to not push my American Western perspective onto Japanese women, so most of my sources are from Japanese journalists and Japanese organizations. So I'm going to start off with a brief history about their role and the um, expectations of women in Japan. And one little piece that I found that represents this really well is Onna Daigaku, which basically means higher education for uh, women. And it was a manual which was often gifted to newly married women by other women or your mom or whomever on how to be good wives and wise mothers or real saigenbo. And we'll see this uh, theme of good wives and good mothers coming up a lot throughout the presentation. Um, and I've highlighted keywords in red just as a heads up. But so this manual um, basically instructed women to be totally subordinate to their husband and father even going so far as saying that women should distrust themselves and completely uh, obey their husband. And this is really old. Um, this is not current. Um, the most current like, physical copy they have is from 1700. And then so things slightly improved during the Meiji Restoration, where compulsory education was introduced. So women finally had the opportunity to get an education. Otherwise, um, the only women who had the opportunity were either taught by their fathers or brothers who went out of their way to teach them. Um, but what's important to note about this introduction of compulsory education for women was the really the only reason that it was passed by the policymakers at the time, who uh, were all men obviously, was that it would prepare girls to be knowledgeable wives and mothers capable of producing diligent, nationally loyal sons. And then after World War II with Japan's new constitution, we see some more improvements for women, with universal suffrage being granted, meaning that everyone has the right to vote. And there was also um, specific articles which prevented uh, discrimination in political, economic, or social relations because of race, creed, sex, social status, or family origin. And then we also see during this time uh, the labor, labor Standards Law of 1947 coming into action, which basically means that men, women, everyone should get equal pay for the equal work. And then we also see this coming back into play in 1985 with the Equal Employment Opportunity Act, which further prevented sex discrimination in the worst workplace more blatantly. But, and this is written into the law, with due respect for women's maternity and to achieve harmony between their working life and family life. Uh, and I don't think it's a bad thing that women can be mothered. I think that's a completely respectable job and a necessary job, but the fact that we see this social expectation of women being so prevalent and um, impactful that it's written into the legislation, legislation I think, is um, very showing. And then today, more recently, we've seen Prime Minister Abe's Womenomics, and um, he's been trying really hard to get women more involved in politics and within the economy, and he's uh, created a lot of programs that are aimed to give women more opportunities to work and get promoted. However, does changing the law always translate into reality? I don't think so because as you can see with this useful graph right here, just because we change things on the macro level within our legislation doesn't mean that it will necessarily change the way that things work in our communities or in our interpersonal relationships. So just um, some facts about the status of women in Japan. The average salary of a man in 2016 was 5,200,000 approximately yen, whereas for women it was 2,797,000 yen. And if you express this as a percentage, women make 54% of what men make. And a common criticism of these statistics is that women are working more part-time jobs, which I do think is a factor, but the reason why they're working more part-time jobs is because they're expected to take sole responsibility of the home, the children, and um, elderly people. And another factor which plays into this and influences um, this large pay gap is the fact that women are not given the opportunity to be in positions of leadership or part of the managerial class. Um, a study of over 10,000 companies in Japan, only six point um, nine percent of them had women in the managerial class. And then the percentage of companies with any women, even just one in the man managerial class at all, was less than half. And then in the political realm, um, we talked about how Abe has been a really big advocate for women. However, in his own cabinet, he has 25 men and only one woman. 
And then, more generally, the percentage of women in the House of Representatives is only 10.1%, which is the lowest among developed countries. And so some of the reasons why we see this happening, um, and this is from a Japanese journalist, is that there is a lack of role models, social norms which discourage women from speaking out, and the burden of an intense full-time job in a society where women are expected to be responsible for housework, child rearing, and elder care. And um, also, we can see some barriers um, to equality for women in academics. Uh, just in 2018, Nine out of Japan's 81 medical schools, which is over 10%, got caught or and or admitted to um, manipulating entrance exam scores to favor men. So, for example, uh, Tokyo Medical University reduced all the applicants' initial test scores by 20% before inflating the scores of male applicants' exams. Basically, they wanted less women in medical school and more men, so they blatantly changed the scores. Um, and the reason why they did this was um, a little sketchy. Um, some of them said that they held women to a different standard because women mature faster mentally than men and their communication ability is also higher, which I'm not sure um, how that would help you take a medical exam. But, um, and others defended the policy by arguing that women were more likely to leave the medical profession to pursue motherhood, creating a staffage shortage in the sector, which once again goes back to the idea that women are burdened with the social responsibility of taking care of children. So what would be the solution to this problem? It's obviously not easy, it's a very complex issue, and though I talk about legislation not necessarily directly leading to change, I do think it is helpful, but I think what's most important is that we reduce the social pressures of women to be the sole responsibility of taking care of children and elderly people and the housework. I think if women want to do that, they should definitely be able to make that choice, but the key word there is that it's a choice and it's something that they want to do. I think we should make those other opportunities available. And also men play a large part in this too, obviously they're half of the population. And there are many social pressures put on men as well to work really long hours and work really hard and provide financial support and sometimes they feel if they can't meet that, that they're a failure. So in conclusion, I think we need to provide more social support for men and women in order to make everyone happier, basically. Thanks for listening.